Good evening. I'm William McLean, Chair of the Department of Political Science, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's debate forum dedicated to the election campaign in Arkansas's 1st Congressional District. The program is sponsored jointly by the Department of Political Science, ASU-TV, KASU, the Jonesboro Sun, and the Department of Radio and Television. During tonight's 90-minute program, a panel of journalists will question all four political candidates competing for the right to represent the people of the 1st Congressional District in the United States Congress. Our 90-minute program is being broadcast live on ASU TV Channel 18, KASU Radio, KIT 8.2, and comes to you from the ASU TV studio on the campus of Arkansas State University. This program is also being taped for rebroadcast at a later time and will be made available to other area cable networks and streamed live worldwide via the internet at KASU.org. The debate was made possible through considerable efforts of ASU political science professor Dr. Richard Wang, Professor of Radio TV, Dr. Mary Jackson Pitts, KSU Station Manager and Instructor of Radio TV, Michael Doyle, and KSU Producer, Writer, and Editor, Mark Smith. Joining us are our candidates, Rick Crawford, representing the Republican Party, Scott Ellington, representing the Democratic Party, Jacob Holloway, representing the Green Party, and Jessica Paxton, representing the Libertarian Party. Studio audience, please welcome the candidates. Now let's meet our panel of distinguished journalists. Joining us tonight, we have Chris Wessel, editor of the Jonesboro Sun, Mark Smith, producer, writer, and editor for KSU, Caleb Phillips, ASU Radio TV and a broadcast journalism major, and finally, Lindsey Blakely, editor, the Herald, and journalism pre-law major. Studio audience, please welcome the members of our panel. be the last time you hear from our studio audience as they have agreed to remain silent until the conclusion of the program. Now let's get started. Each candidate will be allowed to make a two-minute opening statement. The order in which the candidates will speak was determined by a drawing which took place moments ago. After the opening remarks, we will go directly to the panel whose members will ask questions to the candidates in accordance with the protocol which was agreed upon in advance. Our timekeeper tonight is Brandon Fry, a student in the Department of Political Science program. At the end of the debate, each candidate will be allowed a two-minute closing statement. So we'll let the opening remarks begin with candidate Holloway. Yes, my name is Jacob Holloway. I'm the Green Party candidate for uh, the 1st Congressional District. Um, I'm 24 years old. I'm an Arkansas State University uh, student, uh, graduate studies of agricultural science. And um, I mean, honestly, uh, I really shouldn't even be running for the United States Congress. I mean, I, I don't really need to be up here right now, but I am. And why is it? It's because the leaders in our country have failed the people, and they failed me, and they failed everybody in this room. And um, a lot of our politicians are lying to us. And there's a lot of complicated, um, very uh, interesting issues that are out there right now that are not being brought up into the mainstream media are not being talked about uh, by uh, our politicians, and that's why it's more important than ever for third-party candidates to be running in these elections. And so um, the Green Party uh, encouraged me to run. Uh, I felt like this was a great opportunity to uh, be able to talk about some uh, important issues that are important to me and to everybody else. And I'm not any different than anyone else that goes to ASU as much as that uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about the problems that are happening in our country. And I think people really need to think about what's going on. And I want to be here to give some analysis about what's going on, uh, and try and break down some of these issues, and um, really uh, give a chance to explain something that a politician might give you uh, a sound bite to. But I'm going to try and tell you the truth, because uh, I'm not getting uh, campaign donations from multinational corporations. I'm here taking my own time to come out here, put my uh, personal life on the line, and come out and talk about issues that are important to everybody. Congressman Crawford. Thank you, Dr. McLean. I appreciate it. Thank you to the panelists, and uh, thank you to the folks that have come out. It's always great to be back on campus with ASU. I'm an ASU graduate, and it's always, uh, always fun to come back and take part in extracurricular activities on the campus of Arkansas State University. I uh, also want to say thank you to the folks that are watching at home or watching online. We appreciate that and all the sponsors that have come together to make this happen. I want to acknowledge my wife, Stacy, who's with me tonight, and uh, say hello to my kids at home with the babysitter. We're going to hear a lot of talk tonight about a lot of issues that are of great importance to our country. 
And the one thing that I think we really need to focus on that trumps all the other issues, and it was summed up in a very simple statement by the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff under President Obama. About two years ago, he was asked, what is the single biggest threat to our national security? And without hesitation, he answered, and he didn't say nuclear Iran, he didn't say Al Qaeda, he didn't say Russia, he didn't say China. He said, it's our debt. Our debt is the single biggest threat to our national security. And to put that in context, everyone in this room right now at this moment owes at least $50,000 as their share of that debt, growing at 16 plus trillion dollars and counting. And that means every child that's born tonight during this debate is born $50,000 in debt. And that's the debt that we know about. That's not the counting the unfunded liabilities, which would run that up to about $243,000. So if we're not talking about debt and the ramifications of our national policy, then we're really wasting our time. Policy has to be focused on how we get our arms around our national budget. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve this time. Mr. Ellington. Thank you. Thank you. ASU, Arkansas State, uh, KASU, uh, the Jonesboro Sun, KAIT, uh, the Political Science Department. I am Scott Ellington. I'm your prosecuting attorney for the 2nd Judicial District. I'm often asked, why are you running for Congress? And I'll tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the second largest judicial district in the state. We file 7,000 felony cases in this district every year. I understand the importance of a negotiation sitting across the table from someone I disagree with and working out an agreement, a compromise, a resolution. That's not going on in Washington, D.C. right now. You have the Democrats on one side, you have the Republicans on another, and either party would just assume the country go off a fiscal cliff as to get along and work together and negotiate a resolution that's in the best interest of our country. I've made tough decisions as a prosecutor. I'll make tough decisions again. I'm willing to stand up and voice the concerns of the people of the 2nd Judicial District and the 1st Congressional District as well. The whole area, the, the, this part of the state, the 30 counties that, we're, that we represent. I'm here tonight to ask you for your consideration and your vote. Listen to what's, listen to the note or to the comments of each of the com of, of candidates and make, up a, make your decision as we move forward. Ms. Paxton. Hi, I'm Jessica Paxton. I'm the Libertarian candidate for U.S. Congress. I'd like to thank ASU and everyone for having us here this evening. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. My husband, Roger, and I live in Marion. I'm a working home homeschooling mom to two beautiful little boys. I grew up in a one red light rural community in Tennessee. Um, then I moved to Memphis, to Penn University of Memphis, the journalism school there. And I wasn't particular, particularly interested in politics at that time in my life, and that's probably because I felt like neither of the two major parties represented me. And then once I found a Virginia party and realized that I was not politically homeless, <coughs> I jumped into both feet. And over the last few months, I've found that a lot of people misunderstand libertarianism. And I've also found that a lot of people are libertarians, even though they may not realize that. A libertarian stands for freedom. Uh, the freedom for you to spend the money, your money the way you choose. The freedom to live your life and not have others make decisions for you. Uh, libertarians believe that you have rights because you're human and not because the government gives them to you, and therefore they cannot take them away. I believe in letting people live in peace as long as they are not infringing on the rights of others. I also believe, and I'm the only candidate here this evening that's going to tell you exactly what I believe, whether or not you would like to hear it. I'm not going to twist words or spin things to make them sound good. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. I'm not here to make decisions for you and your family. I want you to have the freedom to make those decisions. And libertarians are nothing if not consistent, and so you're always going to know where I stand. This is exactly how I want to legislate in Washington. If a bill came across my desk that expanded the size of government or took money out of your pocket, I would oppose it. That's pretty simple, right? 
If the bill came across that granted you more personal freedom and reduced the size of government, I would fight for that every single day. So you'll always know where I stand. Thank you. Thank you to the two candidates. Now we'll begin. Mr. Wessel will ask the first question. Candidate Holloway and each candidate will have a chance to address Mr. Wessel's question. Then Mr. Holloway will have a chance for a one minute rebuttal of that question. Mr. Holloway. The Congressional Budget Office estimates the 2012 Farm Bill will cost $969 billion over a decade. Nearly $770 billion will be appropriated to the food stamp program. The food stamp program has grown from $30.8 million in October of 2008 to $46 million last October. The program has helped 45 million Americans in 2011. Do these numbers alarm you, and how should Congress go about slowing this trend? Uh, thank you for your question, Chris. Um, I mean, first off, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about loaded spending here. I mean, uh, the Farm Bill is probably one of the biggest shams uh, brought upon the American farmer and the farmers in Arkansas. Uh, I, I, the farm bill is the cause for the destruction of the small farms in America. I mean, when you pit winners and losers in the market and you see the kind of farm consolidation that is happening in our country, and I mean, look at the communities. Look at Wiener, Arkansas. Look at, uh, you know, Tilted. Look at uh, uh, Hickory Ridge. Look at uh, uh, cotton uh, plant. I mean, you go to Desert. I mean, these places are drying up. There used to be vibrant communities in the Arkansas Delta, and that's because we had family farms. All the family farms are gone now, and, and all of our food is no longer made locally. I mean, we make a lot of commodity crops, but not many of these crops are actually um, consumed by our Kansans. We have a lot of um, crops being shipped back and forth, and uh, one of the things that's really important is we get back to local food production. And yes, that number is a lot, because, I mean, you look at, it's covering up a problem that, uh, it, it's just a symptom, and it's not the real problem, and the real problem is people don't have access to nutritional food. Nutritional healthy food is not affordable in America, but you can go down and buy a, a soda pop, or you can go down and buy a candy bar for, you know, a dollar. And, and so we incentivize people to eat bad food, and the government policy is behind that. So food stamps has helped. It reinforced that. I mean, people need to be able to know how to grow their own food. I mean, we need more 4-H programs in our school. We need kids to know how to grow their own food. I mean, and, and this is just general education that should be in the classroom. I mean, this is something that everyone should know. People should be closer to the food that they eat. I mean, people don't even know that eggs come from chickens or that milk come from cows. I mean, that, that's, that's the real problem. Thank you, Mr. Wessel, for the question. Uh, <coughs> I think if I remember right, the thrust of the question had to do with nutrition time, food stamps. The number that you cited there, $700 billion over a 10 year period. Um, and that's exactly right. And it's really at the heart of the debate with respect to the farm bill, the most truth of it. Everything else that we were able to accomplish in the House uh, Farm Bill markup and House Ag Committee was done really in you know, a great bipartisan fashion. Where we had a disconnect was with the nutrition title. And, um, what we voted on and what was ultimately passed, and I thought a very responsible measure, was a roughly 2% cut over a 10-year period. That's roughly about $16.5 billion over that 10-year period. Now, to some, they thought that was too much. And some didn't think it was enough. But I think what we did was try to balance and really found the sweet spot with respect to trying to bring bipartisan vote uh, in committee, which we did, 35 to 11, to really address those concerns. And how we went about that was, I think, uh, very responsible. It was by addressing the eligibility requirements and uh, closing some loopholes. And the truth of the matter is we have a budget situation driven by our debt that's going to require us to make better use of scarce resources. And so what we did was did a reconciliation that recognized where we could uh, address some of these loopholes that are exploited, and particularly in larger urban areas. But the state of Arkansas does a great job managing this federal program. And so the state of Arkansas was virtually unaffected by that, and that is a credit to the work that they did here in administering the nutrition programs from the federal government. So I believe that while cuts were necessary, responsibility and reason approach uh, was the way it was taken care of in the House Ag Committee on a bipartisan basis. Mr. Wessel, I'll tell you, what concerns me more than anything is that we don't have a farm bill yet, uh, and it concerns a lot of farmers. Uh, we need the stability and, and 
the surety of knowing what uh, provisions are in uh, the farm bill and what will go forward. Uh, you understand cutting the, the nutrition program for farm bill at this time. We have uh, unemployment is still at a, at a high number and we have folks coming in, young ladies being left, uh, laid off from their jobs at a quick shop or we have uh, soldiers coming from uh, overseas and they uh, uh, need to, uh, can't find a job right now. And so uh, nutrition is a very important time and it's a sign of the times that we have to feed uh, their children. So I, I believe that it's just a symptom, or it's a, it's a symptom of what our whole country is suffering with, but it's, it's not uh, one of those things that we can't just automatically go in and cut. I think though that uh, uh, there may be some ratcheting down of, of the qualifications for food stamps and uh, ratcheting down some of the qualifications for these programs, but also consider that nutrition is also your school free lunch, your school free breakfast, and those programs as well. And we don't want children to go hungry in this country at this time, and, or ever. And uh, certainly we want to care for them. And so I think that uh, being overly cautious and, and letting a nutrition uh, a provision of the Farm Bill to stay, stand in the way of, of completing the Farm Bill is very concerning. And, and truthfully, if you look at it right now, I think that it was post, the Farm Bill was actually postponed until after the election because they're going to make even more drastic cuts to it than, than we even see right now. And if, if folks think that this Farm Bill looks bad now with the Midwestern flavor, just wait till after uh, the lame and duck Congress takes over and see what happens because I believe there will be even more cuts and it's very concerning to me. If I have a chance to get uh, uh, elected and the folks uh, elect me to Congress, I'll elbow my way to the front of the line to get on the Ag Committee to try to see that the Farm Bill is in place for the farmers of Arkansas that keeps them in line in the provisions that we have. And that's, that's the most important. For my understanding, the cost um, of this Farm Bill over 10 years is almost a trillion dollars. And almost 80% of that um, will go to food stamps. So I'm going to call a spade a spade and call this the food stamp bill. And, and people need to be fed. And if we have compassion, we'll help them. Um, but you don't get moral credit for doing that at gunpoint. If we weren't taxed to death, we would have money to give to charities to help these people in need. Um, I think that that's the job of our friends, our family, our neighbors, our, our church members. It's not the government's place to rob people to pay Paul. I think that we as citizens should be responsible for that. Um, but if we're going to get into the agriculture discussion, it's something that we weren't able to bring up in our past debate on Tuesday. Um, if we want to help farmers in Arkansas, let's look at um, legalizing industrial hemp. Now, I know that there are a lot of misconceptions about that. Um, marijuana and hemp are distant cousins. They're no relation. Hemp actually has... Um, CBD, and that blocks the effects of THC. So if you're going to talk about hemp, think of it as the anti-marijuana. Hemp can be used in fiber, in paper, um, in plastics. It has uses for biofuels. And we're not allowing our farmers to grow that. And as Mr. Holloway spoke earlier, we need to diversify and give our farmers some more options. Um, so I, I'm not sure why we're not talking about this. But um, that's what, something that I would like to do when I get to Congress is look for the, the ban on Brown Hemp in Arkansas. Mr. Holloway, you have one minute. And, and that's wonderful, Jessica. And I, I, I want to follow up on, on kind of um, what, what we were talking about. I mean, three things that the Farm Bill really needs is training. We need to train more ag educators. People need to know about what farming is and how that they can be uh, involved in farming. Uh, we need more education, uh, you know, but I want consumers to decide what the market's going to produce, not the government. And you're going to see lower prices because of that. And we need more small farms. Let's, that's a big job to build. Let's put people to work farming, you know, because we need good food in this country. But I mean, I mean, we need innovation. And, and we're talking about innovation. Why don't we let Arkansas farmers farm hemp? Hemp's the food. You can eat it. You can make houses out of it. You can make clothes out of it. Way better than cotton. Cotton's destroying all of our soil in Arkansas. Why don't we replace it with a better crop? And hemp's going to be that crop. And it's illegal what the United States is doing. And we're, we're holding farmers at gunpoint hostage from one of the biggest cash crops that the United States would be producing. Every country in the world is producing hemp right now, except for the United States. Mr. Smith will now direct the second question, starting with Congressman Crawford. Congressman Crawford, you've been vocal about your support of the balanced budget amendment. Uh, in fact, you've been willing to support it enough to also support increased taxes on high-income Americans in exchange for passage of the amendment. 
How would uh, such an amendment be enforced? Would it, would it fall to the courts and judges to make decisions involving economic and political policy? Well, you know, balanced budget amendments just as amendments to the Constitution. I think if we're talking about the issues that face our country today, whether it be uh, an increase in the debt ceiling, whether we're talking about uh, taxes, whether we're talking about increased spending, if we're doing it outside the context of a balanced budget amendment, a spending limitation amendment, or some sort of permanent spending control, I think we're making a huge mistake. And I want to point to a couple of pieces of legislation that have uh, that have actually been good pieces of legislation in the past, Graham Rudman being one, Pago being another. These are statutory measures that are easily sidestepped as leadership changes in Congress and as we start to, start to see turnover. And so what we want to say is, no, the future Congress, because it's not about the 112th Congress, it's about future Congresses. It's about the continued generational theft that's taking place here, where we have everyone in this audience, as I indicated before, that's a minimum of $50,000 in debt. How are we going to stop that? And to me, the only way we're going to stop that is if we take the, this idea of debt seriously and don't continue to engage in this profligate spending and making sure we buy in the hands of future Congresses. And quite frankly, the only way I think we're going to do that is through a constitutional amendment that forces that behavior out of Congress. I think the question that you ask is how, are, how would it be enforced? And it appears to me that uh, every, uh, every budget that came forth would be subject to being, having a federal lawsuit filed and having uh, the courts decide if every bu budget is constitutional or not, if you have a, a, to answer your question specifically and to answer your, your question more particularly uh, with regard to the balanced budget amendment. You know, uh, uh, there's no businessman in this town, there's no businessman in this state that would want to be told that he can't go to the bank and borrow money if he needs to borrow money to, to complete the year. Now, that, so I, I don't think that the problem is, is the requirements of having a balanced budget amendment or, or, or being, not being able to borrow money. I think that the problem is, is not uh, making appropriate decisions along the way and continually uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, the borrowing of money. It, it's, it's, it's stewardship on the part of the legislators. It's not uh, by requirement of, of Congress. And I think that if, uh, uh, if, if the, the Congress will work together and, and hold down the spending and, and rein it in, you see when Bill Clinton was president, we had a budget surplus because uh, the Congress and, and, and the president worked together and brought uh, the budget into uh, in, in within working parameters, and there wasn't a problem with that. So I don't think that there's a necessity to have a balanced budget amendment at this time as much as it is just to rein in the spending and have some actual self-control on the part of Congress. Um, to be clear, I absolutely um, support a balanced budget amendment as long as the budget is balanced from spending cuts and not from raising taxes. I think that I agree that our, our spending is out of control and I think that we need to start slashing spending, cutting programs, looking at this really hard. It's scary to think I have children who are four and six and it's so scary to think they're gonna be carrying this trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar debt around for the rest of their lives and their children's lives. So we've got to get spending under control. We've got to cut some of these unconstitutional programs, these programs that are inefficient We've got to stop printing money, worthless money that's not backed by anything. I would love to see us get back to a gold standard so that our money is no longer worthless. Uh, for every dollar our government spent, we're borrowing 43 cents. Could your family survive like that? Could your business survive borrowing 43 cents on every dollar? You couldn't, and neither is our government. So absolutely would, would support a balanced budget amendment. Again, as long as we're balancing our budget from spending cuts and not from raising taxes. You know, talking about the national debt's a, a great issue. I mean, this is something that's just overshadowing a lot of people my age. And, uh, you know, look at um, back in 1964 uh, when they uh, started taking silver out of uh, our currency. And uh, one quarter would buy you a gallon of gas. Well, that, that same silver quarter will now buy you two gallons of gas. That's $6. And so you can see the kind of price inflation, the kind of inflation that our currency has, has come under. So you wonder what price is going Well, the dollar, the value of the dollar is actually going down. I mean, this is, this is a symptom of uh, private uh, uh, currency printing. 
which uh, that should be in the hands of Congress and the United States Treasury, not the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, which a lot of Americans now are waking up to the fact that the Federal Reserve Bank is a private institution, an entity that has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve Bank. But I mean, we want to talk about uh, you know where a lot of our national debt is. Hey, you know, balanced budget, that sounds great, but like, where are all the deficits coming from? Well, hey, you know, when you're occupying about three or four countries around the world and you have half your military deployed, I mean, that costs a lot. And you got to build aircraft carriers for that and all kinds of equipment and personnel. I mean, I mean, if the American people really want to get behind these wars, then let's have a war tax. Let's have everybody in the United States pay their fair share and get behind these wars. Because I don't believe that the American people will be for so many foreign interventions if every time we have to go to war, that we have to have a domestic war tax and really get behind these kind of interventions. Because that's what's running up the national debt. Now, there's all kinds of things, all kinds of ways for government spending. But you look at these DOD contracts that are being, no bid contracts that are being put out there. I mean, these are billions and billions of dollars. You know, and then they talk about they want to cut military personnel. Cut military personnel. Like, that's going to solve our debt crisis. I mean, we need to rein in these no bid contracts. I mean, we need a sound money system, like Justin said, going back to a, a precious metal state. I was probably to get one minute. I think Mr. Ellington really touched on the heart of the problem. He said that uh, any businessman in Jonesboro ought to be able to go to the bank and borrow money. And they're exactly right. But they're borrowing the money on their own account. But are we going to borrow another $12 trillion to cover the unexpected additional cost of Obamacare? According to that statement, that's what he would want to do. An additional $12 trillion to cover more entitlement program spending. That's our problem in Washington. We can't continue to borrow money and borrow money and borrow money. I think that's okay. We're not talking about the private sector. If I want to go out and borrow money to start a business, that's great. That's the free market the private sector at work. But when we're talking about dealing with taxpayer dollars, that ultimately would lead to doubling or potentially even tripling our current taxes in our lifetime, I'd say we've got to stop that. If it takes a balanced budget amendment or a spending limitation amendment to do it, that's the route we need to take. Mr. Phillips now has a question to Mr. Elton. All right, so as a college student, getting ready to graduate, finally, I know all too well the cost of a college education. As of now, I'm around $25,000 in student loan debt. That's, as it's daunting, being a broke college student, most of, for the past five years, looking at that and having to pay that off is, I don't know how to face it. And according to a recent report by the College Board and Advocacy and Police Center, the college tuition rose while the financial aid didn't. It stalled. And here's some, here's some statistics. It rose about 4.8%. So if you were paying over $8,200, it would rise to $865. Here at Arkansas State, when tuition rose, it was about $250 to $300. It's a lot of money for a broke college student. So my question, what would you do to help the college student who's wanting to get a higher education, because you have to have in this country nowadays, who just feel like they can't go to college simply because it's too expensive? Well, Kayla, the answer to your question is this. Uh, I will support, uh, not only support Pell Grants, I will support the move to continue uh, a funding Pell Grant program, which uh, is unlike the, our current congressman. Uh, I will continue uh, support uh, student loan programs, guaranteed student loan programs. I would also uh, encourage and support uh, uh, practices like the uh, Delta, Delta Regional Authority that has loan forgiveness programs for going back and working in the Delta and working in uh, job creation areas uh, to help uh, uh, students uh, who have graduated uh, uh, to, to find jobs and go to work and do those sort of things. I believe that uh, uh, the, the, the government benefit the, of, of college students, someone who wants to go to school, should be increased along the level of college tuition uh, to that effect, at least in, in the respect of as the economy goes. And I think that certainly uh, uh, we should uh, offer you that opportunity and any student that opportunity who wants to go to college uh, have, to have that opportunity to do it. I couldn't have gone to college had it not been for Pell Grants and student loans. And uh, many of the people in here who have college degrees couldn't have done that. So we, we serve, I support those and believe that that is exactly what we need to do. Uh, the you know, concern that I have in this whole area of, of education 
is uh, job creation. And I believe that we need to uh, focus on job creation in, the, in this part of the state. And we have many, this is a great four-year institution, but we have many good, uh, great two-year institutions as well that need uh, uh, assistance to draw uh, students in and to draw corporations in and, and marry uh, companies with, uh, bring companies in to employ students and, and, and to uh, actually have uh, research, development, apprenticeship programs, job training programs in those areas so that uh, we can have uh, uh, students who graduate with associate's degrees and can go to work. Students who graduate with uh, four-year degrees can also be at home and be in their area as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Elkins, first of all, what I was going to speak to is that um, we've got to worry about jobs. If, if you come out of college and, and there are plenty of jobs out there for you to choose from, then paying back that student loan debt is not going to be as big a burden. I know that between my husband and I, we've both been out of college for some time now, uh, but we still pay about $400 a month in student loans still today. And I'm not a prosecuting attorney, and I'm not, I'm not a congressman. I'm, I'm an average Arkansan, and, and, um, and that, that's significant money to our family. So I understand the burden of paying back your student loans. But again, I think that when it comes to job creation, we need to be focusing on lowering taxes across the board. When taxes are lower, businessmen and entrepreneurs have more money in their pocket to build their businesses, to create those jobs for these college students just coming into the workforce. Um, if we keep taxing our businessmen like, like we are, taking 40, 50% of, of their income, <laughs> How are they going to create jobs for you? I think it's a pretty simple solution. Let's you know, cut taxes. You're probably going to hear me say that over and over, but we've got to. We've got to cut taxes, and along with that, we've got to cut spending again so that we can get our economy back on track and get these businessmen creating jobs for you, for you college students right out, right out of school. Kayla, I think that's a great question. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm currently in college. I've had to take out some student loans. They've been essential to actually help me finish college in, in some means. And, and overall, I mean, uh, you know, I've tried to stay away from them for the, I mean, for what you mentioned. I mean, they're really just uh, loan sharks in disguise preying on students. But what I'm really mad at isn't so much the college uh, student loan program, as I'm mad at the institutions themselves. Look at the price inflation. At, at these institutions. Look at the wasteful space. Man, when are they going to get done with that fine art building? Well, it's real nice sitting out there, that big skeleton out there. I mean, uh, I guess that's like some abstract art, you know, about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the wasteful spending at college institutions. Or, I mean, I, I, hey, I like football as much as the next guy, but I mean, how much do we really need to pay Gus Malzahn? I mean, do we need billboards all over the state? I mean, going into Little Rock, came on, you know, like, like is that why I'm going to ASU? You know, like, I... I mean, where's our research coming out of this institution? I'm a graduate student. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly dismayed at like the lack of research coming out of ASU. I mean, I mean, maybe if we had a little bit more funding for research, we could get more people into higher degrees and actually, you know, get people into some technical professions. But I mean, look, look at what's going on here. I mean, I mean, college students are having to pay more and more every year they raise tuition. Why can't we put a cap on tuition limits? I mean, that, that's the real problem. Is these institutions. Are just going wild. They can spend whatever they want. I mean, I mean, how how much do you have to pay a college administrator for what they do, and how many of them do you need? Do they all need to be paid hundred thousand dollars each, and do they all need just like one specific little job? I mean, you can consolidate these offices. I mean, this is a huge good old boy system. I mean, people are making money off us poor students, and I'm I'm sad. I mean, I mean, shame on shame on you people making money off us poor college students because we're just trying to get a job like anybody else. And we're trying to get along in the world too. I mean, that, I, that's essentially the American dream, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say is, you know, we, we it speaks to the larger point. Uh, scarce resources are driven by debt, property spending, and if we don't get our hands around that problem quickly, if we don't address that problem, your problem is going to be compounded. Because, like you, I, I, I went to college. Uh, as a result of a combination of uh, veterans education assistance, uh, former military uh, member, and also some student loans. And so I had some student loan debt. Uh, and, uh, and there are programs, there are federal programs that offer uh, student loan repayment, uh, particularly in the healthcare field. There are others. Um, and those resources are threatened because of the fact that we have not been good stewards of taxpayer dollars. We continue to 
borrow, borrow, and borrow, and don't allocate those resources where they can do the most good. But the truth of the matter is, the one-size-fits-all approach to how we educate our young people has also got to be stopped. And that will make better use of our taxpayer dollars with respect to getting that aid where it needs to go and yield the most positive results. Well, I think that uh, when you talk about debt and, and the debt that we, that, that we have in our country right now, I think that you, you have to look back to the last 10 years where we had uh, uh, we, we give uh, millionaires and, 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 uh, and billionaires tax breaks uh, and, and where they get to save a whole lot of money and then you have two uh, wars uh, that's been, that were put on the tabs that uh, that were not necessarily uh, required. And I think that if you look at, at where, how we got into the debt that we have, when Bill Clinton left office, we had a surplus in the budget. We had 4% unemployment. All of a sudden, you have uh, these massive tax cuts for the wealthy, and uh, then you start a couple of wars up, and, all, and, and the country's in debt. So just look who put us in debt in the shape that we're in right now, and uh, then who's, who's hammering at, at, at us uh, at, at the uh, current administration for that. I think that if you certainly, if you look at uh, the situation, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, Democrats were, had left the country in pretty good shape uh, 20 years ago. Ms. Blake, will now direct your question to Ms. Paxton. As I'm sure you're well aware, this election is an important one for women. And according to a recent study, just one year after graduation, women are earning only 82% of what their male colleagues are paying. Um, what would you do to make sure that women and men are paid equally? That's a very good question, and thank you. Um, I believe that, um, that the government should not direct private businesses. Um, I think that a private business has uh, the power to decide for themselves what they pay their employees. And I think that any business that's, that's going to publicly pay women less than men would certainly wouldn't get my dollars. I wouldn't go to, to a restaurant to eat where I knew that the women were being paid less. I do think that in this country, we don't, we don't appreciate our women. As a mother, I certainly understand that. Sometimes um, I feel less appreciated. So I, I understand that. But I think I'm going to wait for my vote and see what my, my gentleman from the party has to say. Mr. Hall. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, Honestly, I mean, you look at wages right now, wages are falling, productivity is falling, um, you know, and it, it's going to be, if it's harder for men to get a job, I mean, you know, I mean, how unfair is it for, I mean, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, obviously I'm not a woman, but um, I'm having a hard time getting a job, so just, you know, think about, we're all in this together, and so the women's struggle is also uh, the men's struggle. You know, to be able to get a job, and I mean that's that's essentially what this is. I mean, uh, you know, the fact if there is wage discrimination going on, that should be prosecuted. That should be prosecuted, and people who uh, are engaged in wage discrimination should be brought uh, under the current existing laws. I mean, a lot of people just shut up; they don't speak out. And if women are being, uh, you know, uh, discriminated against for wage discrimination, they need to speak up about it. And like as a society, we should encourage our women to get higher paid jobs. I mean, and so if this is not so much like a government thing, it's like a, a societal thing. I mean, I, you know, I know there's some um, movements going on to try and bring back the ERA in Arkansas. Uh, there's some movements going on, um, you know, to try and pass more laws for equal, equal pay. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we need to punish the people who do that. And, uh, and also, at the end of the day, I mean, women need to know that they are equals with men and that they deserve equal pay. And when that's not happening and the woman's being discriminated in their workplace, I mean, they need to, they need to find a lawyer. I mean, and then maybe tell Mr. Ellington, you know, hey, I'm being discriminated against and I need someone to help me. And so, I mean, that's, that's at least, you know, in a kind of uh, concise way what I can say about it. He touched on some great points there, you know, uh, discrimination in the workplace, whether it be based on gender or any other, uh, certainly needs to be a shadow uh, about, and people need to know about it, and we need to take whatever actions necessary to rectify that situation. Interesting statistic, you know, we still have 23 million Americans out of work, and that's not a gender bias, that's a fact, these are Americans. It's not 23 million American men, it's not 23 million American women, it's 23 million Americans out of work, and that's because our economy is in such sad shape, driven by what else? A common theme, death. And again, if we can, if we can address these things, we can talk about these things, and what are we going to do to uh, correct these problems, then we're
we're on a better path to address problems in the workplace. But uh, women have made great strides uh, in, in the last decade, certainly, and, and if they're not being treated equally, then, then that certainly needs to be talked about. My wife is a professional woman. She's got a master's degree. She's worked in a professional capacity. And uh, when I got elected to Congress, she chose to make the decision to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom. And she works harder than anybody I know. And so I, I'm the last person in the world that wants to see uh, women discriminated against in the workplace or otherwise. Well, like well, let me tell you, I, I, first of all, we now have the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which uh, it is, is, is a great uh, uh, law and, to, because, and it was brought in effect because of this very reason. Uh, a few months ago, I was asked about supporting the ERA. And, and I, I, I made the statement that I was offended that we're still talking about the ERA and, and, and that we're, we had to pass a law just in the last few years to mandate that, that women get uh, equal pay for equal job, equal work as a man. There's no reason for that. I mean, uh, if, if any individual for the job that they're doing should be paid, uh, it should be equal time for equal pay, no matter what the gender of the person is doing. And it's wrong and it's discrimination. I don't think that I, as a state prosecutor, could file charges against somebody, but certainly there are civil claims that could be uh, uh, filed, and, and so I, you know, I, in fact, I know I, I wouldn't, but uh, the, uh, 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 you know, there are civil actions that could be taking place, but I, I'm offended that uh, there's that concern is, is here. It should have been taken care of 20 years ago, not uh, not just now, bringing, as we brought forth the Lily Ledbetter Act as uh, the, the current uh, or the former Congress two years ago, four years ago did. Uh, so it, women should be paid the same as men, and there should be uh, exacting uh, uh, regulations and punishment to prevent uh, uh, discrimination based on gender. So one minute, Ms. Paxton. Yes, I agree that absolutely women should be paid equal time, equal pay. I, I completely agree with that. Um, but I also agree that the government should not dictate how a private business is run. Um, but I hope you can understand the difference there. I would expect a private business to pay women as equals. Um, and, and Mr. Hall Radley um, spoke uh, about minimum wage. I, I don't really think there should be a federal minimum wage. I think that as, as that number rises, then costs are passed on to consumers, um, and it's just inflation, inflation, inflation. Um, I have looked at the ERA. Um, I've met some nice people who work, who work for that cause, and, and my own criticism is that, heaven forbid, we ever um, have another draft that women will be drafted just as men, and that's something I guess will not certainly would want to see our, our mothers paid off to war involuntarily. Thank you. Mr. Wessel, now again, <coughs> questions with Mr. Holloway. Mr. Holloway, <clears throat> numerous polls suggest the economy and job creation are the number one issue for Northeast Arkansas voters. What, if elected, will you do to bring good paying jobs to Northeast Arkansas? And I, and I want you to be specific about that. How do you attract new industry, how do you convince existing industry to expand? Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I mean, one of the biggest problems right now is our, our tax rate in the United States. Uh, I, I know this isn't a very popular notion, uh, but we need to actually lower corporate tax rates uh, in the United States and in our state alone, uh, because if, I mean, I mean, basically, the, I I I heard you need basically a zero corporate tax rate in the United States. Uh, that makes it friendly for businesses to come in. I mean, you look at the outsourcing that's going on. The big problem is the outsourcing. We can't compete with, uh, with, with China. We can't compete with India. We can't compete with developing markets because we have almost uh, one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world. Now, <coughs> as far as industry is concerned, we need to focus on agricultural innovation. Um, uh, I, I mentioned hemp earlier. Um, that, that's a textile. Uh, we need people to come in and we need companies that are uh, manufacturing, but we need people who are also processing. I mean, look at, look at uh, some of our agricultural industry, like the catfish processing. They're all going out of business, and they're, they're having to import catfish from China just to process it. I mean, and so you're looking at one of these problems where uh, we're, we're losing industry still, and uh, we need economic innovation. I mean, look at, um, we, we could have um, wind energy, you know, 
uh, solar energy. Uh, we can have, I, but we have corporate subsidies for, uh, you know, basically oil and natural gas. Now, natural gas is fine, and we're, we're doing that uh, as long as it's regulated properly. But, but the problem is, is that the government, once again, thinks it needs to pick market winners and market losers. We need entrepreneurs to come in with excess capital, buy up these firms that are failing, turn them around, and get people working again. And that's going to be the free market. It's not going to be the government. I, I trust people. I trust the people in this country that they know how to spend their money and that they know how to invest it, not the government. And we need to lower the tax rate and let businesses be able to work in uh, a less regulated environment. Excellent. Thank you for the question. And uh, he touched on some good points. And agriculture is key in the first district, obviously, from a federal perspective, what do we do to help empower businesses in the first district? When we first talked about agriculture, he mentioned this. Uh, new innovation, further processing, peanuts in Randolph County and Lawrence County. A new crop that's double uh, in acres or triple in acres for uh, year over year, I believe. We're going to see peanuts emerge in the first district of Arkansas, and that's great for our economy. There are a number of jobs associated with those two buying points that were put in recently, just uh, early part of the spring. And as that grows, we'll see those jobs increase. But what role does the federal government play? Quite frankly, uh, we're carrying too much debt, our taxes are too high, and our regulatory regime is entirely too strict. And so if we can take some action and show the private sector that we are being serious about our debt, that will free up some investment capital. If we uh, reduce that corporate tax rate, Right now, I believe we're the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. In Japan, maybe Ireland is higher than we are. Bring that down to a manageable level. President Obama's level is 25%. I'm comfortable with that. And then, again, the regulatory regime is just entirely too strict. And what we need to do is, is take the heavy boot of regulation off the throat of these entrepreneurs. And they will put that capital to work. And the First District of Arkansas is a great location. We've got a lot of uh, uh, transportation infrastructure here. Our energy costs are relatively low. Our taxes are relatively low. And so from the federal standpoint, those three things we have to work very hard on to incentivize that capital, the investment capital, in the free marketplace. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think that, uh, first of all, we go back to education. We, I, we work with uh, the two-year schools and the, the vocational schools in the first district and uh, have them uh, work with them to increase their uh, research development wings of their uh, facilities. Uh, I've, I've said more than once that I would act as a, a federal member of their Chamber of Commerce. If the mayor of Wynn came to me and said, we want reporting this business to come into town, would you would you reach out to them? I would, I would actually assist and reach out and try to bring them in. I want to see uh, federal dollars going into our two-year schools and even our four-year colleges uh, to increase research development so we can prepare a workforce to go to work. The joy of, of any family, of you and me and others, should be to see our grandchildren grow up and right before our eyes. If we send our kids off to school and they go to, uh, they, they travel four hours to Arkansas State, or they travel six hours to Fayetteville, and then they meet somebody, marry, they go off, they're not going to come back home a lot of times. So if we, if we work in the local areas and try to develop educational processes and then recruit companies to come in to each of those areas, that brings jobs to this district and up and down the district along that area. Another thing that we could do on a federal level is increase the, uh, uh, the depreciation allowance uh, so that, you know, one of the things that you have a tax break for uh, folks that, that make over uh, uh, $250,000, $300,000, a lot of times they put that money in their pocket, but if they have a depreciation break where they incent have incentive to go buy equipment, then they'll buy equipment, write that off, and then they'll hire somebody to use that equipment. And then we need to increase the depreciation rates on, on new equipment and increasing the size of business. Give tax breaks to companies that are coming in and bringing work here, as opposed to uh, the current congressman uh, filed or uh, voted to uh, give tax breaks to companies that ship jobs overseas. And, and do that, not do that. I mean, it, we, we need we need no tax breaks for shipping jobs overseas. And, and another thing is uh, the, the Thank president. You. Thank you. Uh, I have a question: What can we do to attract new industry and um, help the old, old industry expand? Okay. Um, I, I feel like a broken record, so I do apologize. But again, I'm saying cut spending so that we can lower taxes. We cut spending, we can lower taxes so that we can spend. Um, 
can can come in and create brand new jobs as long as it expands uh, the older industry. I would also love to see uh, us completely get rid of, of an income tax, is that something like a fair tax or, or a consumption tax, uh, and abolish the IRS. Can you imagine um, how many millions of dollars businesses would spend every year just getting their taxes done? Let's let's um, let's change over to something something like that. I think that if we allow our businesses to, if we can privatize Social Security, I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about down the road. Social Security is broke. It's going broke. It's going down. It's headed towards a cliff. So let's do something now. Um, so I think that we need to look at privatizing Social Security to give our businessmen a break. Uh, I think that individuals should um, could be responsible for their own employment insurance, and that's something that, again, the businessmen wouldn't have to, to provide. Um, I, we need to get back to being responsible for ourselves and not letting other people be responsible for us. I think that that's sort of a lost art here in America, and it's really sad. And I, I think that we need to reduce regulations and let, and let the free market work. Good one, Mr. Holland. And, and so, um, yeah, it is a great example. The other, uh, I mean, just yesterday, I was driving through cotton plant markets. Man, I mean, it looks like a farm in that city. I mean, there's nothing there. I mean, and these used to be our vibrant farm communities. You drive down Highway 49. I mean, where are they? Where are they? Well, it's all the small farms. All the small farmers are gone. I mean, that's what people used to do as a subsistence lifestyle and employment was their farms. I mean, we need more Americans owning land. Our Kansans need to own their own, their own land, and our Kansans need to get back to homesteading. I mean, this, this is the kind of economy that we live in. Like, you need to build your own job. You need to be an entrepreneur. I mean, we need more excess capital for investment. But I mean, in the end, I mean, we also need innovation. Look at, I mean, a great American, George Washington Carver, and Congressman was talking about peanuts. You know, that's a great example. All the things that we can do with processing our agricultural commodities. And we're going to grow commodities here. We need to process them here in the market. Mr. Smith. Well, we talked a little bit about higher education, but I want to talk about the education system as a whole. For a government that's meant to be of the people, and by the people, and for the people, I think most of us would agree that education is a key element in our democracy. Uh, Congressman, do you have any thoughts on how we can improve our education system overall and to better prepare our children for their future and the future of our country? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I'd like to see is more local control, less federal uh, control, Schools. Last week, I, I held a school nutrition summit atten attended by uh, 10 superintendents from around the district and some parents and uh, our, our 10 panelists that actually testified before our bipartisan committee that we put together. And, uh, and there were a number of superintendents from schools around the district. One of the chief complaints that they had was the federal regulations that they were forced to implement but without any funding. So again, we hear this term of unfunded mandate that comes up, and it comes up all the time schools. And the question that, that, that we got is, why doesn't Washington recognize that we know our students? And so we're talking about nutrition, but really in a broader sense, we're talking about every day dealing with these kids, whether it be nutrition or whether it be their education. And so quite frankly, I think our, our, our local school boards under the direction of the state, not the federal government, are in a much better position to address the needs of their students than some bureaucrat in Washington that has no idea who those students are and what their particular needs are. And that seemed to be you know, the common theme throughout from these 10 superintendents that testified before this panel. Uh, but that seems to be the consistent uh, thought with regard to any federal regulations as it applies to education, is they want more local control. They want state oversight but local control. And I think if we can achieve that, we're in a, we're in a much better position to educate our young people and meet their needs. Well, I agree uh, that local control is very important, and I, I agree that uh, continued federal re regulation is not always uh, a benefit. Uh, however, uh, schools can enjoy getting the federal money that, that, that they get, and so there are, uh, uh, you, you, the federal government's going to watch uh, how the money is spent. Uh, but I believe that uh, certainly it's handled better on a state level. You see, each of the states' uh, schools are working on a, a, the, the common core curriculum, which is uh, much like the Uniform Commercial Code. Each state uh, sets its own curriculum, and, and they, but they set it up to match because it's the state working it with each other. And it's not necessarily the federal government doing it, it's the state uh, government doing it. 
And, and I'm very concerned about the no child left behind in the law. I mean, uh, my, school, my wife is an educator as well, and uh, I, I, I meet very few uh, uh, classroom teachers that are very happy with the no child left behind uh, uh, law. And so I think that that would be a problem, uh, you know, be something to, to have a relook at as well. Uh, and so that, that would, I think it would improve education for our students as opposed to hamper education if we set that aside and, and uh, repeal the, the no, uh, no Child Left Behind law and let uh, the schools work uh, together, the states work together, uh, as in uh, the Common Core curriculum. Uh, yes, we, um, we're a homeschooling family, so this is, this is interesting. You might get a different perspective from me. Uh, we chose to homeschool for many different reasons, uh, but one of them is that I'm more interested in fostering um, a, a love of learning than a love of test taking. And I'm afraid that with, with federal control over our local schools, how else are they going to measure their success but with standardized testing? And that's just not fair. We need our kids to love, learn to love learning and not um, taking, taking standardized tests. I completely agree with Representative Crawford here and we need more local control. I, I'm a state states rights girl myself and I think that let's just abolish um, you know, the federal government having any sort of control over, over our schools and give that control back to the states. Different states have different needs. And Washington may not have our Kansan needs in their, you know, our, our own interests. Um, I also would love to see something like, like a voucher system where let's say that each child is allocated $6,500 for the year. Well, you know what? Those schools are going to be competing over getting those students and competition leads to a better quality product. You're going to want to have a school with the nicer facilities and the better teachers to attract more students and, and to attract that money through some sort of, of voucher program. It's, we have so many administrative costs here on the federal level, so many administrative costs here on the state level, the county level, your local levels. The bulk of our education dollars are going to the administration and not to our children. Our children get the leftovers. I don't want children to get the leftovers. I want them to get what they deserve. So let's just take the federal government out of it and give that control back to the states so that more money can go to our children. And so, you know, if, if, if Americans, people in the first district, really want to know what's going on behind our school system right now, read a book by John Taylor Goddard called Dummy Nuts Down. He was a New York City school teacher. I mean, he was the best. He, he kept getting awards after awards of being a great teacher. And he resigned uh, as his position as a teacher on the editorial page of the New York Times. He said, said I'm resigning as a school teacher because I don't want to mutilate and hurt kids anymore. Because that's what our educational system is doing to our children. I mean, you look at the mess that our educational system is in, and what it's doing to kids, it's not preparing anybody for anything. It's preparing people for standardized tests. And then it's, it's preparing people to go to college, but it's not preparing them for any real skills. I mean, they're taking out uh, you know, most of the uh, BOTEC programs and, and the technical programs that you know, are real life skills kids need to learn. I mean, there's no hands-on training. They're indoors all the time. They're being taught the managerial style of how to do it. They're just being taught how to take orders. They're not being taught to be Americans, stand up and think for themselves, and build their own businesses and the real skills that they need in life to be successful individuals. I mean, that's the real problem. I mean, we need good teachers, and all the good teachers are being run out of schools. And, and what you're left are with the people who didn't really want to be there to begin with, and they don't even like kids, and I don't even know why they're teaching. You know, I, mean, I had to go to the public school system. Let me tell you, I mean that was traumatizing a bit. Mine. <laughs> and, 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 and higher education is just as bad almost. But I, I mean, we, we really need to reform in our education. And if, if the public school system can't do it, uh, you know, I mean, there's charter schools. I mean, uh, um, you know, and those are doing really well in uh, New York City and Harlem. Uh, we've had seen a lot of. Success with those. I mean, this is a, a really big uh, issue we need to talk about because um, you know we don't need children hating learning and hating school. We need them to love learning. One minute. Um, just to follow up, I think what we've done is we've really done a disservice to our kids with the notion that you have to go to college to be a success, and that's unfortunate. And this gets back to the point that you raised about how do we attract new businesses to 
First District of Arkansas, and it really comes to workforce education. There are young people that leave high school that don't necessarily need to go to college. If they do, they need to go to a junior college, but they don't need to be sold this bill of goods, that they have to have a four-year degree, bachelor's degree, or above, or they're not successful, because I know a whole lot of electricians, carpenters, plumbers, and so on, that make very good money. And the point I'm trying to make is, what we need to do is create the kind of curriculum that identifies and helps these students that, for a variety of reasons, need to be in the workforce quickly, right after high school. So partnering with our junior colleges and our above techs and so on, and not be locked into this idea that success is defined solely by a four-year degree. Okay, so my perception from the outside looking in is there doesn't seem to be a lot of cooperation in Congress. Um, this country was founded on compromise. We had founders that went in to, from Philadelphia to develop one of what I believe one of the best nations in the world. And they locked themselves up and they compromised. They came in with, this is how I think a nation should be founded. This is how it should be built. And when they left, we had a constitution that we still have today. And it's a great document. But now it seems like our lawmakers can't get along. They can't work across party lines. They can't work across branches of government. So my question is, how will you work with a different party? How will you work with a different branch of government to really accomplish goals that strengthen this government, uphold the Constitution, and really make America the greatest country, solidify it even more than it already is? Well, I'll tell you, you know, as I said, I, as the prosecuting attorney, uh, we, I understand the art of negotiation. I understand the requirement of negotiation because we file so many cases in our district every year, and there's no way that we can have 7,000 jury trials in our courts. And we, have, we have nine courthouses. There's no way we can uh, stack them up and have that up. I understand uh, sitting across the table and negotiating with the opposing counsel and reaching an agreement. That's, that's the talent that, uh, that's something that I've worked at for 20 years as a lawyer, work, reaching an agreement. And I think that uh, certainly uh, working across party lines, you see, I, it's well known that I'm not uh, the party's darling uh, for the Democratic Party. I wasn't the party's choice uh, when they supported me in the, in the primary. I'm not beholden to the Democratic Party. I'm not beholden to any party as far as every vote, every time. I can vote with a Republican. I can vote with an independent. I'm not, I don't have to vote a, a straight party line. I, I, I can be man enough to stand up. I, I think I've just demonstrated that I have the courage uh, through my uh, prosecutorial uh, years uh, to, to have the backbone to make right decisions and, and sometimes make tough and unpopular decisions. But, but still, to stand up and, and reach out, and whether it's, it's across party lines or whether it's across uh, administrative lines between other branches of government. Now, I won't be uh, discussing anything with a federal judge and, and the Department of Justice, but certainly uh, uh, with the uh, uh, the executive branch and talking about it at the administration and, and also its uh, 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 in you know the, the organizations that uh, that are affiliated with it. So I, I don't think that there will be any problem with me reaching out on behalf of the constituents of this this part of the state and, and discussing with agencies or dis discussing uh, uh, with commissions to try to benefit what's going on for our part of the state. I can do that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Elliott. That's a very good question. Um, our Constitution was written to limit the power of government and not to limit the freedom of its people. And I think that our federal government has way too much power and has gone way beyond uh, the boundaries that of, of, of the Constitution um, gave them. And I think that I think that when you vote libertarian, you're going to get the best of both worlds and a lot of cooperation because most of the time I'm going to, I'm going to fiscally agree with, with the Republicans and I'm going to socially agree with the Democrats. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a 2006 Gotham poll where 59% of respondents said, yes, I identify with being fiscally conservative and socially liberal. And that 59% of people, those people are libertarians. And if, if you watch them this evening and you people in the audience tonight think, yeah, that's me. Well, congratulations. You've just become a libertarian. And so if people would vote their conscience and not down party lines, and libertarians would be running this country, and we would be leaving you alone. Um, so I think that, that the federal government has just gone way beyond its, its, 
is intended use and, and that he really needs to write himself back in and and you know this is the tenth amendment give that power back to the states and stop adding costs adding regulation adding at those sorts of things and and let the state take, take back control your question is the reason i'm running for congress I mean, this, this is, I mean, I, I, I'm so frustrated with what I hear from our leaders. I mean, they just, they just lie to your face. They don't, they don't even care. They're shameless now. They just lie to you, you know, and, and you call them a liar, and they say, yeah, I'm a liar, and then they go on. I mean, that's why I, I don't even watch the presidential debates because it gives me a headache. I mean, lis listening to these guys, I mean, they're just two jokes, you know, and then you don't have any real issues being talked about. I mean, if people in America, if the citizens of America really want honest government, I mean, look at what the Democratic and Republican parties have turned this country into. Look at the mockery that they've turned the Congress into, and the White House, and I mean, even the judiciary branch to a lesser degree. But I mean, I mean, stop voting for Republicans and Democrats. Please, the people at home, when you go to vote, stop voting for Republicans and Democrats. Just don't do it. Just get there and like, I know a lot of people are thinking that they might vote for a third party candidate. Well, this is your year to do it. Send a message to Washington, D.C. and tell the two major parties that you're sick and tired of their, of their show that they're putting on for us. I mean, it's not even entertaining anymore. You can laugh at it, but I mean, it's really sad. I mean, I think most of the politicians are, are egotistical. They don't want to uh, even uh, talk to ordinary people. I mean, they're not approachable. I mean, I. Sorry, Tom, you're approaching. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, listen, I mean, for the most part, I, 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 I hear the same rhetoric coming from both parties. If you want something different and you want a single voice to Washington, D.C., I mean, elect someone like me, elect someone like this Pat. I mean, it, and there's so many other choices that could be on the ballot. But look at the reaction that we have from the two major parties. We can't even get our third parties on the ballot. It's so hard. That, I mean, there's a lot of good people who, run, who want to run for office, and they can. Uh, I think bipartisanship is, uh, is, is critical. It's critical to uh, moving significant legislation, and, and it is lacking. And I will point to Obamacare as a primary example of a piece of legislation that was uh, really forced on the American people on a straight party line vote. And that's why it's important that we recognize we have to work Together, particularly on big pieces of legislation that affect everybody, like health care. One of the things you know, I talk about, uh, uh, you know, making sure that we have permanent spending controls in place. But one of the things I think that we need to do that would hopefully affect bipartisanship is to look at a bill I've been working on for a year. But it's it's an amendment that would require a supermajority before Congress could implement any further entitlement spending. That's a bipartisan approach to major policy issues. Now, you know, further down, let's look at some things like, for example, the Fuels Act. I wrote the Fuels Act in direct response to a situation that was happening here in the first district of Arkansas with on-farm fuel storage and the thresholds that we thought were unreasonable by the EPA. And um, we worked across party lines. In fact, with my uh, primary co-sponsor on that bill, Leonard Boswell from Iowa, uh, we worked on that bill equal number of uh, Democrats and Republicans, passed it out of committee without a single no vote, went to the floor, passed it out of the House without a single no vote. It's now working its way through the Senate uh, under Senator Pryor and Senator uh, Inhofe from Oklahoma. And I suspect we're going to see the same result there. It's a good piece of legislation. It was crafted in a bipartisan basis. And that's the kind of spirit that we need in Washington right now. And that's what I've engaged in, not only in the Farm Bill markup, Fuels Act and other things, and we have to be willing to work across the aisle. I've done that. Well, I'll tell you, uh, actually, uh, the congressman's voted 94% of the time with uh, the Republican Party, and very few times have he strayed. I think that the model uh, uh, to work in a bipartisan effort would be to look at uh, uh, Congressman Mike Ross down in the 4th District, who's voted uh, uh, numerous times with the other party, and even though he's elected as a Democrat. He votes uh, with the Republican Party uh, numerous times, and, and uh, he, that's a model uh, for someone who doesn't just toe the party line and vote 94% of the time with, with their uh, their leadership. And uh, so I think that I would have the backbone to stand up and, and to my party and say, I'm, I, I see this as benefiting the people of the first district and not follow through with just uh, uh, towing the party line and, and, and uh, following their direction.
in the interest of time, if I could, could you limit your responses to this question to one and a half minutes to allow you to get your full two minute closing statements in? Um, gun control has always been a large issue. Relating the issue to college students, there's been a long history of gun violence at universities across the nation. Um, even in 2010, there was an ASU student shot and killed on campus. Um, some universities are actually now discussing whether they would allow people to carry concealed weapons onto campus. And it seems that public opinion is split down the middle on this issue. What is your position? My position is that the Second Amendment gives me the right to bear arms. Um, and I don't think that there should be any exclusions to that other than on private property where a private homeowner or businessman can tell you that they don't, you know, that they don't allow guns. I think that if you look at the history of, of school shootings and, and mass shootings, there are almost always in places where you are not allowed to, to carry guns. So what happens? You go to these places and people are defenseless because well, they're following whatever law, and they say, okay, well, I, I will carry my gun, and then, um, well, criminals don't care if they follow the rules. Um, so I think that it's very important that we do allow um, our students to be able to protect themselves at school. I, I'm speaking of, of colleges, of course, and I don't want elementary children to bring guns to school, so please don't put that in the paper. Um, I do think that, that everyone has to have the right to defend themselves, and I think that um, especially here in Arkansas, that, that that's an issue that uh, most of us hold dear to our hearts. My husband and I both are concealed carry permit holders. Uh, we do obey the law, but there have been many times when we have not um, spent our money in a particular business because they don't they don't allow guns, and that's their right to make that decision. But they sure won't get they sure won't get business from me. Mr. Holland. I mean, uh, so I mean, there's always going to be gun violence no matter what. I mean, when you take guns away from uh, law-abiding individuals, then the criminals are the only ones left with weapons. Um, you know, I mean, look at the country of Switzerland. They, they actually issue fully automatic assault rifles to all their citizens. They all get them. And you know what? They also get two years, two years of, of training. So everybody in the country of Switzerland has uh, fully automatic assault rifles, and they get training uh, by their government on how to use them properly, clean them, break them down, uh, how to maintain your weapon. And um, Switzerland's never been invaded. Everybody lives, leaves Switzerland alone. I mean, and, I mean, but I mean, look at the United States. We, we have a history. This is part of our national heritage. I mean, we're American. I mean, we have guns in this country. I mean, this is part of our of our history. I mean, and, and we're at, most of us are responsible citizens, and we should be allowed to have that right that has been given to us. And I mean. I mean, just down the road from where I live, I mean, some dude got shot on Monroe Street over some cell phone minutes. Now, that doesn't make me necessarily want to ban guns, but, I mean, that makes me want to get my concealed carry. I mean, I don't want to get shot over some cell phone minutes. I mean, honestly, I mean, people should be able to have the right to defend themselves. Look at violent crime. There's no violent crimes in Switzerland, hardly. I mean, I mean, that's a relatively safe country in other countries that allow people to have gun rights. I mean, you want to talk about uh, you know, women's safety or people who uh, <coughs> are, Thank are, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, I certainly support the Second Amendment. I'm absolutely endorsed by the NRA and uh, have other members who like that. I certainly think that, you know, obviously universities ought to have uh, a say uh, with respect to policy and uh, respect that. But I want to address one thing that uh, Mr. Ellington said that, that Mike Ross, he brought that up and he, he votes Across party lines. Uh, in fact, in the 111th Congress, Mike Ross voted 94% of the time with, uh, with uh, his party. That was under Speaker Pelosi's direction. Uh, at that time, she was the Speaker of the House. Uh, but the difference is that Mike Ross does not support Obamacare, and Mike Ross does support the balanced budget amendment. So, in one sense, I could say, yes, he'd be a good role model for Mr. Ellington. On the other hand, he might want to do a little bit more research and find out that he has, in fact, a record of voting with his party. Well, and uh, I'll, I'll take that and say that Mike Ross is, a, is someone who is uh, to be a model, and uh, he has, in, in the past, uh, certainly voted uh, 45 to 55 percent. But to address the answer to this question uh, for gun violence, uh, 
I believe, I, I too uh, have a concealed carry permit. Uh, the NRA gave me an A, P, or AQ rating because I'm not the city congressman and they, they uh, go with the, uh, uh, the incumbent most of the time. <laughs> However, uh, I support the Second Amendment and, and uh, believe that uh, carrying uh, is, is, is appropriate most of the time. Uh, the question of carrying on this campus, this campus is uh, governed by uh, an administration, and just as uh, a, a business can put a sign up that says no, uh, no guns, the legislature has said you can't carry a gun on here, the state legislature. So uh, until your state legislature changes the law, uh, that's the law, and uh, it's my duty to enforce it. Um, in the interest of time, I will just, um, I guess I'll sort of repeat what I said. I, I fully support the Second Amendment. I don't think there should be many exceptions to that, if any. Um, and I do think that where people can protect themselves, there's less likely to be to be gun violence. And if you're a criminal, are you going to go onto a campus knowing that, that people are armed? No. Would you break into a house that with a big sign that says, we have guns? No, you're not. You're going to look for, for the, weak, the weak link. And as a mother of two little boys that... Uh, it's my duty to protect them. Uh, you, but you better believe that, that I will absolutely support your right to carry concealed, carry open. Um, I'm about as pro second amendment, I believe, as you'll find. Now you've heard the candidates' responses. Each candidate will have a chance to make a two minute closing statement, beginning with Ms. Holloway. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I, as I sit here tonight, I'm getting a chance to be able to. Uh, debate with the congressman and Mr. Ellington and Mrs. Faxon. I mean, I mean, this is quite a miracle that the Green Party and the Libertarian Party are here tonight uh, to give you some objective views on politics. And uh, and, and I, I'm I'm just so honored to be able to speak to uh, the constituents of the first district. Um, but I, I also want people to think. Uh, I want people to understand that uh, when politicians give you easy, quick answers, very uh, complex issues are lying to your face. Do not believe your national politician because they're lying to you. And that is the main reason I'm frustrated. I, I'm, I'm honestly insulted uh, that politicians think that it's okay to lie. And I mean, so I'm, I'm running for Congress. And I want more people to run for Congress. I want more people to run for Congress. I want young people to run for Congress. I want people to run for public office. I want people to be engaged, and that's why I'm up here. And I hope this is an example to other people, and if you're afraid of coming out and running for public office, just do it. Just do it. If there's something that you're, is important to you, go out and run for public office, because, I mean, that's what we have. We have a participatory, democratic republic. And if you don't participate, then it's not democracy, and it's not a republic. And, and that's what we have to lose. I mean, this, this is an experiment. This, this has only been around for like 200 years. We can lose this. We can lose this. And, and do you want to think that people just sat by, the American people just sat by and lost one of the greatest um, anomalies in, in human history? I, I say not. And that's why I'm here tonight. I'm asking you for your vote. I, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to be accountable. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that everybody has the courage to go out tonight and, and vote third party. Uh, tomorrow when you go out, tell all your friends, uh, you know, vote third party. Thank you, Dr. McLean, uh, Chris, Mark, Caleb, and Lindsay. Thank you all for your questions and uh, the faculty, staff, administration, all the folks who put this on. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, a few years ago, I was sitting virtually in the same chair uh, asking you for your vote, and, and the citizens of the First District honored me with that responsibility, and it's a responsibility I take uh, very seriously. I want to give you a little bit of background, kind of refresh your memory. Uh, I'm not a traditional politician military brat, served in the Army myself as a bomb technician. I've been a rodeo cowboy, most recently a farm broadcaster, started my own business with my wife and uh, built that business and have some experience creating jobs. So uh, I'm not your traditional uh, politician, but I had, I had an unusual upbringing. A lot of kids are military brats, but it's not a common experience. And uh, I want to tell you a little story about uh, my growing up years. It was common for us to live on base houses. And my dad was a career military officer. And so we would move into base housing. And my mom always made it a beautiful home. That was borrowed. We weren't owners of that home. And we would live there two years, three years, and then it would be time for my dad to rotate to a new duty station. 
And so the moving trucks would show up, and they were packed up everywhere, and the house was empty. And I thought, okay, fine, we're going to move. We're going to move on to our next duty station. My dad said, no. He got out the buckets and the mops and the sponges and the brooms. And I said, Dad, why are we doing this? We're leaving. We're not going to live here anymore. He said, because we're going to leave it better than we found it. And I learned that lesson at a very early age. Leave it better than we found it. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We are not leaving our country better than we found it. And each of you are in debt. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, which is about 10 miles away. I grew up in Craighead County. I understand the needs of the people in this part of the state, and I, I seek to serve you as I do currently as a prosecutor, but I, I'll take those that same common sense values to Washington if you'll let me to be your congressman. It's like this. When the current Congress tries to balance the budget on the backs of the middle class and continue to give tax breaks to the wealthiest of Americans and makes, uh, to try to make our people, the people in my family, the people in your family, uh, have to bear the burden. And all this debt that we're talking about, that's because there's been two wars and there's these tax breaks for all these millionaires that, uh, that doesn't trickle down. I would favor tax breaks for the middle class, for those of us who actually have to work like my dad, who worked for 35 years at, at, at General Electric, and my mom, who was the, uh, the, the lunch lady at the school cafeteria. That's the people that I seek to represent. And I, I'm not nearly as smooth and, and have little finesse. I haven't been in broadcasting. I just uh, go to the courtroom and try to work things out and uh, try a case in front of a jury occasionally. But the thing is, is I'll stand up and fight for you. I'll be your voice in Washington if you'll elect me. Congressman talks about all this debt. He doesn't discuss the fact that he spent $80,000 franking mail to you last year and another uh, eighty to 100000 this year, sending you cards, nice shiny cards with his name on it, telling you that he uh, opposes to Obamacare. Uh, those are the things that, that, that adds to the debt. That didn't stop him from sending that mail to you. I will be a steward, uh, a good steward, for your resources, and I'll stand up for you. I have the backbone to, to do that and make decisions for you. Ladies and gentlemen, the federal government is not a bad thing. It, they provide electricity and, and rural electric, electrification. Thank you, back Thank you Ms. Bellington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that you're not here tonight or you're watching tonight so that you can vote for the most eloquent speaker or the person that derives the most votes and statistics. Um, I'll be honest, I, I'm no special, I'm not a city representative, I'm not, I'm not a, a prosecuting attorney, I'm an average Arkansan, and I think that's why you should vote for me. I understand the struggles of the everyday Arkansan. I, I drive a used seven-year-old car, I take budget vacations, I live in a modest home, I buy my children's clothes at, at Walmart, um, and so I would never, I'm not wasteful at home, and so I would like you to understand that I would never be wasteful with your tax dollars. I think that's incredibly important. And just like you, I'm very worried about the direction our country is headed. We are in, in multiple foreign wars. We have troops in 90 to 900 to 1,000 different countries all over the world. Um, we have worthless money. We have, have people taking our, our freedoms every day. And I'll be honest, that I'm pretty scared about that. But I'm going to ask you to trust me, and I'm going to ask you to be libertarian with me for more election. And I'm going to ask you to put your trust in me. And I want to show you that politicians are not all the same. Um, and if, if you send me to Washington, then I, I will represent you fairly. You will always know where I stand. I think I've been pretty clear about that. And I don't think you should worry about what the polls say and who your friends and neighbors are voting for. You need to find the core of us that you connect with and that you believe in and, and vote for us and, and not worry about party lines so that you can have a clear conscience when you leave your public place. Um, because in the wise words of our Libertarian presidential nominee, Gary Johnson, uh, the only wasted vote is a vote for someone that you don't believe in. And studies show that 65 to 75 percent of Americans agree that we need a third party. Uh, so we're here, we're here to stay, and uh, you'll see us here again in, in 2016, hopefully. So I, I thank you for your support and your vote, and um, I would love to be right by you.
studio audience, please join me in thanking the candidates for their participation. <laughs> Thanks as well to our four members of our panel, to our timekeeper, and to our hardworking and talented ASU students who work behind the cameras that made this effort possible. Thanks to all of you who came out tonight to join us in the studio and to our radio, TV, and internet audience. Thank you for tuning in and good evening.